Okay, so we're starting our writing lessons from great author number two, where we're going to be focusing on voice. Um, the definition of voice that we're going to be using for the purpose of this activity is it's the quality of prose created through a combination of diction, tone, and other resources of language that allow the writer to communicate successfully in a particular writing situation. So as you remember, um, diction is our word choice. And tone is um, the arrangement of words that make the writer's attitude come across and other resources of language. We're going to be looking at things like syntax and like repetition and a variety of other things. Okay, so we are looking at um, a quote from E.B. White, who you, I know you remember from Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little, um, but what you may not know about him was that he was a master at the personal essay, and he published many in many like of the big time magazines like The New Yorker and Harper's. So this is an um, opening sentence from his 1941 essay, Once More to the Lake. It says, one summer along about 1904, my father rented a camp on a lake in Maine and took us there for the month of August. Um, so this is a really engaging opening, or blah, blah. this is a really engaging opener for an essay because you hear the author's voice. Um, it matches the, the, the essay's content. This is very leisurely, right? It's about a lakeside vacation and it uses leisurely language where things like along about 1904 or this month of August. Um, so how does he achieve this voice? Um, for the most part, um, his big resource is diction, um, like word and phrase choice, and syntax, word order. Um, the heart of the sentence um, is the arrangement of these monosyllabic words. A camp on a lake in Maine took us all there. This is a very pure, innocent kind of word choice that really reflects what the whole essay is going to be about. Um, but you may remember, like, E.B. White did not write so, you know, informally all of the time. Some of his other essays are ex were very formal and some were much more carefree. So um, his style is very deliberate. Okay, so let's look at example number two, Edgar Allan Poe from The Telltale Heart. I know you guys read this in like seventh or eighth grade. So um, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, is always a favorite because he does these great characters who are mentally unstable, right? And um, his short stories, often the things are not what they appear to be. Um, so they're very sophisticated ki kinds of mysteries. And the he's always kind of teasing the reader with what's going on and he wants us to figure it out. Um, so Poe, you know, despite, I know you, you all know the background of Poe with that, you know, his whole madman image that he was, you know, a drug addict or he died, you know, from alcohol poisoning or he was, you know, suffering from illness all the time. Um, but he was a craftsman and he was very much in control of his fiction. Um, and you can tell this in Telltale Heart. He gives us like all of these little clues that dist that reveal this voice of the main character. And this is a very unreliable character. So let's look at it. It says, true, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been an am. But why will you say I'm mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. So if we looked at this passage at face value, um, we would believe the narrator, right? He's insisting he's sane and can tell his story calmly. So, you know, why not take him at his word? So if we were reading this quickly and not paying attention, we might. But of course, we listen to the narrator's voice. The narrator is not calm. He may say he's calm, but he is unstable. So how has Poe been able to have a narrator say one thing, but yet reveal that he is something else? Um, and he does it through these resources of language. Um, 
And first and foremost, he is meticulous in his diction. He uses words like hell. Like who says, you know, I have heard many things in hell. Nobody says that. Um, and he he se seems to, that seems to indicate like it's a place of suffering. Perhaps he is suffering. Perhaps there's something evil going on. He also repeats a lot of different words. Like, for instance, when he says, very, very dreadfully nervous, right? Like that indicates that he's actually extremely nervous and it, it creates this jittery rhythm. And it does suggest that he's not balanced. Um, twice, he poses these rhetorical questions. He says, but why will you say that I am mad? And he says, um, um, how then am I mad? Um, you don't ask rhetorical, rhetorical questions unless you know what the answer is. Um, in this paragraph, we feel like we've accused him of, you know, madness and we haven't accused him of ever anything. We've just really met him. Um, and so he sounds extremely paranoid, which is exactly what Poe wanted to happen. So you may be reading this and, you know, at first you think, well, I, you know, I was inclined to believe you, but now... I think you're mad. Okay, so our third example is this wonderfully brash, opinionated voice from J.D. Salinger um, from The Catcher in the Rye. Um, this was one of the first works of literature to deal with the inner world of a troubled teenager, Holden Caulfield. And Holden is as memorable as the, as the story. Everybody remembers the person and the character much more than they remember the plot. Um, and this sort of brash, opinionated voice, um, Holden uses as an armor to protect his kind of sensitive soul against the world. So here is a quote from Holden Caulfield. Grand, there's a, world, there's a word I really hate. It's a phony. I could puke every time I hear it. Um, so J.D. Salinger was not a teenager when he wrote this. He was a grown man, and what he did was he studied and noted the diction of contemporary teens of the time. This is around the 1940s, obviously not today. Um, so words like phony and puke were perfect for this writing situation. But obviously they would be completely wrong choices in, let's say, an English class. Um, for instance, if you had to write about this and you said, this novel made me puke, um, while that would give you a distinctive voice, that would certainly not give you the correct voice for an essay in class. And that is going to bring us to our next um, part of this, which is voice mistakes that students make in English class. So, you know, when it comes to trying to find your voice for your typical assignments in school. Um, students usually make two classic mistakes. Your voice is either too informal or it's too artificial. Informality is not always appropriate. Um, you may, for example, be asked to write a personal essay. Like when you apply to college, you're going to be writing your college application essay. Um, and with that, we expect, you know, clarity and control of language in the first person. Um, but more typically, you're going to be asked to write critical essays where you are responding to a work of literature with a more objective and impersonal tone would be more appropriate. Um, so there's, you know, you, you need to be aware of, of your audience and the purpose of your essay. So let's look at, you know, a voice that's too informal for a critical essay. As for the main guy's best friend, he's an arrogant jerk. Okay, obviously, it's very casually structured. It uses contractions and informal informal diction, um, and that it sounds even though the idea is actually correct, it brings the writing down because it's too informal. So you may not do as well on on it in terms of your grade. Now a lot of people go the other way and they you know try to make themselves sound like very serious and intelligent and they throw in a bunch of SAT words and you know they want to you know make it more sophisticated and it doesn't always work and they kind of come across as too artificial for instance the protagonist's brother portrays himself as prideful contemptible and narcissistic okay now i i guarantee you guys have tried sentences like that right but 
what you have to ask yourself is, would I, do I speak like that in class if I was discussing the book? So hopefully, no, you're, you don't talk like that. Um, so you would use perhaps a more straightforward verb. Um, for instance, you might say the protagonist's brother is instead of portrays himself. Um, and you would might say proud instead of prideful. Um, or maybe um, you would, you know, say contemptuous instead of contemptible, um, you know, because you're trying to describe a an attitude, not judge it. And you're not going to just throw in random extra words to sound impressive when you're speaking in class. So when you're writing, you want to use a clear and unpretentious voice that does not stray into informality. Um, so you could say something like the protagonist's brother is arrogant. So that would be it's clear, it's to the point, and it's formal enough for the paper. Okay, so let's do a little bit of practice on this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some student sentences um, that were written about um, an analysis of an occurrence at Owl Creek by Ambrose Bierce. And you're going to determine A, if the sentence is too informal, B, if it's too artificial or awkward, or C, if it's appropriate. And then you're going to fix any of the sentences that are too informal or artificial. Okay, so you may have noticed that um, the first one, the personification of death, is um, the personification of death is that he's this important dude. Um, that's way too informal for an essay. Now the, you know, the idea is is correct. It's just that the way that it's conveyed is wrong. So a possible revision could be something like death is personified as an important person. Um, the second one, Bierce's elu um, elucidation of the military code as liberal exhibits an aspect of maximum irony. Okay, that again, that, that sounds too artificial. Um, a possible revision might be Bierce's description of the military code as liberal is deeply ironic. Um, number three, seems to me that the main man's getaway plan is pretty ca crazy, too informal. Um, a revision might be the hero's escape plan is far-fetched. Um, and the last one, the last sentence of part one instills in the reader an element of suspense. That one is the best of all of them, but it is still um, a little bit um, artificial, especially in the end. So you could say the last sentence of part one leaves the reader in suspense. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, an exercise that is kind of designed to heighten your awareness of voice. So we're going to do something called the twice told paragraph. Um, I'm you're going to write two short paragraphs in response to the following prompt. How does the world society presented in the age of miracles, the book we're reading, um, reflect our modern day? So you can, the first paragraph needs to be a personal response. Um, so you should include your personal observations and experiences. The tone should be informal and you should write it in the first person. The second paragraph is an impersonal critical response. Um, you need to rely on concrete analysis from the text. You need to blend in quotes. Um, and what I am looking for when I collect this is the appropriate voice for each. I want you paying attention to your tone, point of view, and use of evidence. Um, so each paragraph needs to reflect an appropriate voice for the assignment. So one needs to be a personal, one needs to be a critical. Um, as always, if you have any questions or problems, you can pop on by 234 after class or after school or shoot me an email. Thanks and good luck.